We will be talking the Trinidad and Tobago judicial system in Trinidad and Tobago and more so what's happening with the appointment of judges to the High Court, the Marseille Air Caesar, I, I don't even know what to call it, fiasco, um, incident, um, situation that Trinidad and Tobago now seems to find themselves in. And to discuss it more with me this morning is yeah. Martin George. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, good, good, morning. Morning. good morning to you and good morning Trinidad and Tobago. Well, the thing is, the, the simplest way to put it is that we are, we are still embroiled in the imbroglio. Yeah. <laughs> I like <laughs> you <know>? that one. <laughs> because that, that, that's the nicest way yeah. you can put it. Because I, I, as I've said repeatedly, there's no easy fix to this one. And there's no easy way out of it. You know, um, I saw on the weekend, um, Senior Counsel Ramesh Lawrence mm -hmm. Maraj, he had a press conference where he gave his views on it. Um, you know, some of the things he suggested, I think, appear to be based, I, I guess, maybe either a bit on speculation or maybe on some special information that he has. Because, you know, he was raising questions of duress and mm -hmm. raising questions of non est factum, which is a legal principle whereby you would say that, look, even though I signed this, this was not my act because, you know, I was either coerced or duped or tricked, mm -hmm. you know. But the thing is, as I said, unless he has some special facts that have not yet come out in the public domain, mm -hmm. I wouldn't even want to venture into the realm of speculation on that aspect of it. But what, from what we know, what has come out, it just does not look pretty and it is not a simple solution. There's no simple solution to it at all. Martin, how did we get to this point? <laughs> how did we get here? What is going on with the judicial system? Well, the thing is, you know, I mean, I, I, I would still want to divorce this incident from the judicial system okay. generally, you know. And, I mean, on that note, I would certainly say that those who have been making the calls saying that, you know, the Chief Justice must resign, um, I am not sure at all that the, it is a scenario that is necessarily mm -hmm. meritorious of that type of call. You know, and we must always understand, first of all, and I've said this repeatedly in Trinidad and Tobago, I think the, the function and the role of the Chief Justice, it is way too onerous and, you know, burdensome for one individual because you have an administrative function, you have a financial function where you are the financial officer, you know, you also have a judicial function and you have a management function, you know. So I think we need to maybe look at, you know, some kind of reform where we split this mm -hmm. and you, 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 you divorce it so that you have different, you know, responsibilities maybe in different persons. So like, for instance, how in some jurisdictions you have a chancellor, you know, of the judiciary who would now be responsible for certain aspects of things. And then, of course, you would now have the chief justice sitting as the judicial head to more focus on legal cases and appeals and that kind of thing, as opposed to having to juggle all these portfolios at once. So I, I think there is need for us to have some introspection and look at some reform going forward. But does our constitution and our judicial system allow for that? Well, not presently. Right. You would have to have some mm -hmm. legislative reform mm -hmm. to allow that. But I mean, separate and apart from that, that still does not exculpate anyone from the responsibilities that you have when you sit as the JLSC, as a body. Because certainly, you know, due diligence must be part of your portfolio in your interviewing process, in your vetting process, your screening process, in the selection of persons for that office. I mean, it's a very serious responsibility. And, you know, notwithstanding what has come out, you know, I think certainly if everyone were to, you know, look squarely in the mirror, you know, you would say, well, look, hey, there are things I could have done better. Mm -hmm. that, that's the nicest way to put it, you know, because the thing is we, we need to move a little past the blame game and the yeah. finger pointing and say, well, look, hey, what could we have done better? What can we remodel, reshape and fix going forward for the future? You know, but I mean, of course, that has to come from a point of, first of all, admitting that, look, something went mm -hmm. wrong. If there's no such admission, then, of course, it's difficult to move forward. So that, that, that's one of the challenges I see here in this, in this scenario. But in this instance, it seems that no one really wants to admit that one or the other is wrong. <laughs> that, <laughs> so. Well, uh, apart from the mea culpa, which came from right. Miss Caesar, 
you know, um, and, you know, of course, I think the, the speculation we had um, from Mr. Ramesh Maharaj over the weekend was basically whether she jumped or she was pushed, yeah. you know. <laughs> I think the, that, that sums up what, what he was um, suggesting in that regard. And then he was, you know, he, he went on to, you know, extrapolate from that theory to say that, look, if it is that she was pushed, then maybe her resignation itself is not effective because mm -hmm. he then went in to look at the constitution and the procedure for the removal of a judge. But I'm not sure it necessarily applies unless you have the first base element of your evidence established. And the thing is, as I say, so far, it just appears to be speculation because from the public record, she has made an admission of some wrongdoing mm -hmm. or some guilt. But that then in itself is a two-edged sword. Yeah. Because by so doing, how then can anyone have any faith or trust in you, yeah. even if you return to the magistracy? In other words, how then could any prisoner, any attorney, any defendant yeah. who is before you feel that they can rely on you when basically your public admission has been that, look, I have been guilty of either um, non-disclosure or willful deception, you know, it, at worst, mm -hmm. you know, of the persons who were interviewing me and seeking to appoint me to a higher office. So it, 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 it's, it's really embroiled yeah. <laughs> in controversy all around. Then you, you have questions of, for instance, the legitimate expectations of other magistrates who may be aspiring to the post of chief magistrate. Can you now just pluck someone and put them back as chief magistrate frustrating the aspirations of those who are there, who are looking forward to saying, well, look, you had yeah. moved out, so I was now that going to apply for that turn, post. Yeah. And, I'm next you know, in line. Oh, or is it that you then now put her at the end of the queue and she now comes back as the most junior magistrate having to now serve her time? You know, so the, the, listen, <laughs> the, 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 the ramifications and implications of this matter will keep resonating and reverberating for quite a while. Explain to us, and, and people who may not understand, how is one um, appointed to the High Court from the magistracy to that? What is the process? Because there's even been debate as to the process. Right. Well, the thing is, and that's, that's why you see the call from the Law Association and I guess from some senior attorneys and other groups in society saying, look, there should be more transparency mm -hmm. because there really isn't um, as much disclosure or transparency in terms of the process as some would like. And, you know, we have moved away from, you know, the traditional system we used to employ years ago, whereby, you know, you, there would be a nod and a wink and <laughs> someone would be invited to, <laughs> you know, send in your application because, you know, we, we, we were looking at you, we, we have our eye on you as, as, you know, judicial material, you know, that kind of that thing. That's also ancient you know. in English. Yes, that's the point. So people are saying, look, let's have a more transparent and open process whereby persons can know exactly how you do this and how you come up with your choices. And it may redound to the benefit of the commission itself because if their entire process is laid out for full public scrutiny, then I guess there may be less room for you to um, either make missteps or errors along the way because, in other words, there would be that full accounting all the way because everyone knows what you are supposed to do next, what is the next step, what you should have done here. So maybe there is, uh, you know, some merit in that type of call because it would probably help us as a nation going forward. I mean, you see how it's done in other countries, say, for instance, in the U.S., mm -hmm. you know, when they're choosing judges for the Supreme Court. I mean, you, exactly. you have a full public hearing. It's televised all around yes. the world. The people are grilled. I mean, if you remember the Clarence Thomas mm -hmm. hearing, you know, I mean, Jeff Sessions actually... <laughs> Um, he, he had it easy for um, his post of um, attorney general, you know, but um, Neil Gorsuch, um, he had his grilling mm -hmm. recently also, you know. So the thing is, I guess there is some merit to that type of transparency because it allows persons who may say, well, look, hey, there are reasons why this person should be, shouldn't be appointed. I guess they can come forward with the information. I mean, Anita Hill was the one who came forward in the Clarence Thomas matter, you know. So the thing is, we have to use this as an opportunity for introspection, reflection, and growth. But as you said, quite rightly, there must first be the admission that, hey, listen, we did something wrong, we messed up, we, we, we need to clean it up. You know, if there isn't that first step, it's difficult to take the other steps moving forward. But again, 
there's the other side of it where you now have the legal action um, threatened whereby you know there, there's question raised as to the composition of the JLSE itself. You know, the, the issue about the age of the members serving on it, you know, in other words, is this in violation of the Constitution? Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, we know for sure that the JLSC in its own appointments, in other words, persons that it appoints to the bench, there's a cutoff point for the age 65. We know that. Now, the question is, is the wording in the Constitution so broad and generous enough that it also applies to the members who serve on the commission itself. And there's a you question. See? And that's the issue. So in other words, it's, it's not a frivolous question at all. It's something that ought to be examined and clarified once and for all. So therefore, we have some certainty in terms of how this is done going forward. One of the things that Ramesh Lawrence Maharaj brought up as well was reform in promotion. He, he also mentioned that, about the age, as you mm -hmm. were talking about, uh, whether, um, whether there were magistrates there who were older and waiting, um, who should be given um, that approval? Is it the younger ones who are maybe more qualified? I don't know what constitutes qualification, or the older ones who have been there longer? Well, you see, the thing is, um, I, 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 I'm not sure that you, you only use seniority as your yardstick. I mean, we have seen in appointments, say, for instance, from the puny judges to the appellate level, we've seen that seniority is not always the only criteria. In fact, there have been scenarios where some um, persons have felt slighted or they felt overlooked mm -hmm. because they uh, were the more senior persons, but yet still younger judges or who had a younger a shorter tenure mm -hmm. on the bench who are appointed to the Court of Appeal above them. So the thing is, I don't think seniority is the only characteristic. But of course, if you're looking at meritocracy, then you must set out very clear and specific guidelines as to how you are judging and assessing the meritocracy so that everyone now has a fair chance and the fullest mm -hmm. opportunity to participate. So in other words, if it is that you say, well, look, um, you must have delivered, you know, 25 um, judgments for the year, then at least that's a base indicator that everyone who is aspiring for that position to be appointed to the Court of Appeal could say, well, look, yes, I've delivered my 25 judgments. I've satisfied that first criteria. Mm -hmm. Then you may say, well, look, of your 25 judgments, one must be in a, a major constitutional area, one must be a major judicial review, you know, yeah. case, that kind of thing. So then you know have further criteria, so therefore they can say, well, okay, yes, look, I have done that, a major constitutional matter, yes, I've done a major judicial... Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you are using meritocracy, the only way a merit-based system is fair is if all parties are made aware ab initio of the parameters within which you are setting your criteria to say, well, look, this is what you need to qualify. Okay. If you don't make that process transparent and in fact we have many judicial review cases which show that look the courts will uphold anyone who complains and says look even your merit-based system is unfair because you have not made the criteria known to all of us you are saying it's merit-based and you are choosing persons at the back end but you're not letting us know what we're supposed to do at the front end in order to qualify to reach the end of the race you know so I think all of these are things that you can look at to improve the process and ensure that, look, going forward, we avoid such pitfalls. All right. Well, we are talking the judiciary. We're talking the Marcy A. Caesar situation matter as well in the courts. What's happening with that? And Martin George speaking with Good Morning Trinidad and Tobago here. We do take a short break. Um, we will be right back continuing on this discussion. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Good Morning Trinidad and Tobago on CTV, CTVTT.com and Talk City 91.1 FM. And um, we are talking what's going on, what's happening in the judicial system, in the judiciary with respect to um, Marcia Ayers Caesar. Um, she, until Chief Magistrate, until a number of issues surrounding, she has been. Um, will not actually be returning to the post of Chief Magistrate until a number of issues surrounding her appointment and subsequent resignation as a High Court judge are fully considered. And this is according to the JLSC. And it was made clear in a lengthy statement issued by the Judicial and Legal Services Commission, Service Commission, which is the JLSC, 
which placed full blame on uh, Caesar for the fiasco surrounding her appointment as a judge and her subsequent resignation and gave a step-by-step -step account of what had transpired. Now, she resigned, this is Marcia A. Caesar, resigned from the High Court on April 26th after being appointed, and the decision came after criticism was leveled at the JLSC for the appointment and after several prisoners whose matters were being handled by A.S. Caesar caused an uproar after being told that their matters may have to be restarted and, um, before another magistrate. So that is where the, the whole issue started to come up. Uh, Chief Justice Ivarachi initially said that A.S. Caesar would return to her magisterial post to complete the matters before her. Can that yes. happen? Well, that's the whole thing. And, you know, I mean, while the statement, as you say, it was quite a lengthy statement, it was designed to, you know, clarify and elucidate. But I think um, in some respects, it has also helped to obfuscate because you look at it and in some ways it does raise more questions than answers in terms of, you know, what is put forth as an explanation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think therein lies the difficulty because you couldn't say that you accept that she has deceived you and been basically dishonest with you and then have confidence to put her back mm -hmm. in the magistracy. Even as a normal magistrate, worse yet, as the chief magistrate, worse yet even to continue matters which are part of before her. You know, so the thing is, on the one hand, if you honestly and genuinely accept that she was dishonest, deceptive, she didn't provide full disclosure, then in that sense, you could not have any confidence in her as a judicial officer at any level. So therefore, you could not be the same body that is seeking to put her back there. But we're talking about the legal body that's seeking to put her back there. But what mm -hmm. about people who have cases before her? Well, th that, that, that's, it, it's even worse for them because they now could not have any confidence in her sitting as a judicial officer presiding over their matters. I can imagine lawyers would be ponying up, basically, to file judicial review applications against anything that she attempts to do. So that's why I keep saying that th th there's no simple fix. There's no easy way out of this conundrum. Because what then happens to those part of matters what then happens to those persons who have been languishing for years, waiting for their matters to be finished? I mean, some may be out on bail, but the persons who are not out on bail, I mean, is it really fair to them for something that is not of their doing, not of their making, that you may tell them, well, look, your matter may have been going on for the past four or five years, and we now have to start all over again. How would you feel in those circumstances? You know, it, it, it doesn't appear to be the aims or intent of justice. And we're talking about current cases, but what about cases that she's already judged? Those well, past cases. I well, mean, I would imagine those past cases would be, I, I don't think there would be an but issue wouldn't in relation that, to Wouldn't them. that call into, her, uh, into question her honesty as well and her, um, you know, how she would actually judge a case? All these things, if, if you were dishonest in the sense, wouldn't it also um, throw light? Maybe I, I look well, at too many um, well, law shows the, the, well, that, you know, the, they would go back <laughs> to look at some of those cases yes, before and the, wonder, the well, is, was she biased in this or was well, she fair in this? But, but the point is, you see, unless you have specific evidence in relation to each and every matter, you would have to basically give the benefit of the doubt. The same way someone could be, you know, a very unscrupulous businessman and a devout churchgoer, you know, on Sundays, you know, so from Monday to Saturday, you know, a very unscrupulous businessman, but then on Sunday he's a devout churchgoer. You still have to give the benefit of the doubt to say, well, look, unless it's proven in specific instances. So therefore, um, I, I don't think that the cases that are completed would really impact on this unless someone has, as I say, specific evidence. So otherwise, it's really the ones that are pending. And then, of course, the question of where do you place her in the system? Where does she fit in in the magisterial pecking order? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think it could be fair at all to the other magistrates who may have legitimate expectations that she can be placed back as chief magistrate. You know, and then, of course, it may not be fair to her now to say, well, look, I'm putting you at the bottom of the rung as the lowest magistrate, you know. So 
how do you get out of this? Then there's, there's the question, was the position advertised? Because there's a process whereby you appoint magistrates and that kind of thing, you know. D did she, was she screened in that way? Was she interviewed? You know, so <laughs> there are so many issues swirling around still that I think that there's little chance that we can see her in the near future sitting on the magisterial bench and I guess even less chance of sitting on the high court bench um, in Trinidad and Tobago. Well, that would have been my question to you, which you basically just answered, because how would she have been... <laughs> I, I tried to anticipate. <laughs> you did. That's a good lawyer for you. How would you, uh, you know, say that she was the right candidate for the high court? How, how, do, how do you judge that? What's the criteria used to appoint someone to the high court from the magistracy? And, and, and I think that is one of the issues as well that's it come is. into question. Is. How was this done? Yeah. And is it just one person that has to figure this out, or should a group of people come together and decide uh, with certain criteria? Well, the thing is, I mean, at present, remember, the, the responsibility resides with the JLS. Yes. Now, the thing is, we've had in the past several magistrates who have been appointed to the high court bench, and, we've, and they've gone on to become mm -hmm. very good judges, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so the, the point is, it's not impossible, but of course, I would imagine that once your due diligence is done and you... So in other words, I, I think this now allows the opportunity to create basically a template that you must have a certain checklist. All right, you must produce yeah. the records for all the cases you've done, all the cases outstand. If you understand yes. me, let's, let's... So a situation like this does not happen again where there are pending the cases. Let's operate on the basis of empirical evidence. This is what j judges would tell... You know, jurors in a criminal trial focus on the evidence, the evidence before you. But wouldn't, she, <laughs> wouldn't she have had to have done that before she moved on? Because now you find well, out that she does you know, have cases we, pending. We, this is what we're saying. We would assume that that ought to have been part of the process. But then now we're hearing, you know, very, you know, different explanations and persons are, you know, twisting themselves into contortions to try to explain, you know, much like you, you see Sean Spicer yeah. ev every, every day, poor fellow, you, you feel sorry for him as he comes out to give a new explanation and a new twist. So much so that, you know, uh, someone else is now giving those briefings. <laughs> yes, 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 and Sean is hiding in the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so many memes about that one. Yes, so where yeah. does this leave magistrate, high court judge, what is she exactly? She's no longer, I think she well, resigned well, as a high I, I, court. At so. present, she's neither fish nor yeah. fowl. That, 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 that's the unfortunate thing. And you see, I would think that certainly the career prospects don't appear too, too bright for her at this point because this has been played out so much in the public domain mm -hmm. that I would think that anyone appearing before her in any forum where, you know, where, where she sits in a, in, in a judicial capacity, would, it would be, she would be such an easy target, mm -hmm. unfortunately, for judicial review applications, maybe build constitutional motions, that, you know, it, it is really going to riddle the rest of her career, her legal career, with, you know, so many pitfalls that, you know, it, 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 it is going to be really tremendously difficult for her moving on from here you know, in a judicial capacity anywhere in Trinidad and Tobago. And that, that's the unfortunate reality. But as I say, we must not just focus on this. We must also try to focus on ways to fix the system. Yeah. Because, say, you know, in other words, okay, she has been the sacrificial lamb, it appears. Unfortunately. But the point is, beyond that, you must also look for redemption. In other words, how do we fix the way towards salvation? Mm -hmm. You think that's any time coming soon? <laughs> I, <With> that I, <laughs> that's what I can't predict. <laughs> that calls for a lot of yeah, reform and a lot yeah, of change and a lot of consensus yeah, within yeah, the, the, yeah, the law yeah, system, the judicial yeah. system, the constitution, mm -hmm. all of that as well. Yeah. Um, and that will take... And, and, and as I said, it, it requires some introspection and maturity to say, well, look, hey, what did I do wrong? Where could I do better? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing, you know. Um, and I, I think unless we have that as a starting point, it's difficult to move forward. Yes, and calls for the CJ to resign is not always the answer. You know, every day, no, every, no, no. everything and that I, happens I these days, publicly, they want you know, everybody because, to resign. You know, yes, and, and you, you know, I've said that on this show several times. <laughs> you know, you've heard when people have, they, when Reid Mark was the speaker, they called for him to resign. You know, and I yeah. say, listen, hey, 
we, 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 must, we must be careful in Trinidad and Tobago because I, I think it's become almost like a habit now. Like yeah. The slightest thing people say, well, it should be that. We, we, we need to be clinical and logical yeah. in our analysis and say, well, look, not every sin is a mortal mm -hmm. sin. All right. If exactly. you go back to your days of catechism, you know, you have the venial sin and you have the mm -hmm. mortal sin, mm -hmm. you know, and not every sin is a mortal sin. And it may be that some errors are forgivable, yeah. whereas some may be so egregious yeah. that you say, well, look, clearly this one is the biggie. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, you, you assess each one on a case by case basis. And well said as attorneys do. <laughs> and it's a fact. It's a truth. Thank you very much, Martin George, Always a for pleasure. speaking to us about this issue. Of course, it continues, but we will continue right after this day.